Hi there and welcome to the 41st episode of Career Stories Live. So today I am joined by Jerry McHugh, who is founder and director of Global Health Film, which is a non-profit organisation bringing people together for education. So welcome, Jerry, and thank you for joining me today. Oh, hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here. No problem. Really looking forward to talking to you. It's definitely an area I've not spoken about before, so that's great um so jerry and i met through uh, espresso plus which is a membership community that we're both members on which is headed up by john Asperian, um, and it's mainly for people that use linkedin for their business so that's kind of how we met um so as always please do comment to let us know that you're here where you're joining from feel free to ask any questions now if you're watching live or later on catch up um, and we will come back and answer those questions later on if it's on catch up so the basis for the lives for anyone that hasn't watched before, I've just been interested always really in what people do and why they do it, like learning about different roles and career paths. Um, and the idea really is that that gives me information that I can pass on to clients and people that are looking for advice on places to source information. And I guess have always given me some really great career tips. So that's the idea. So over to you, Jerry. Can you give us a brief intro to you and what it is you're doing right now work-wise? Yes. Uh, thank you, Sarah. So as you said, I'm the founder and director of Global Health Film, which so that's a, a, a micro charity that I set up um, some years ago. Um, we work at the intersection of arts and health using really brilliant storytelling usually documentary but not only we also work in animation immersive technologies um participatory theater and journalism to spark discussion and debate around difficult complex interconnected issues in global health and global health is essentially about inequity so um we are sort of deeply engaged in issues around uh, climate change, environmental degradation, human rights, social justice, um, infectious disease, etc., etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So quite a quite a broad range of issues, but looking at those through the sort of multimedia um, creative lens, I guess. Excellent. Sounds really interesting. I'm looking forward to talking a bit more about that as we go through the session. So let's um, start with early careers. So did you have a job whilst you were at school or college? And if so, you know, what was that? And has it helped you in any way in your career? Yes. Um, so, yes, I did. Um, I started working uh, when I was 14 um, on Saturdays, always in retail, started working at our local bakery. Uh, and then uh, from then, for many years, right, through university, um, I worked at Marks and Spencers um, on Saturdays and during the during some holidays, Christmas holidays, um, and through the university um, summer um, summer holidays as well. I worked at Marks and Spencers and then also in a bookshop, which I loved. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what was really helpful about all of those experiences were so they were all in retail. So by definition, um, I, I was on the shop floor. So by definition, they were customer facing roles. So they gave um, me lots of opportunities, I guess, to um, uh, to find opportunities to, to step up, to take responsibility. Um, all of the places that I worked had fairly exacting standards, m and in particular, around mm. care and customer communication. So there was a discipline and a rigour um, that I think stood me in good stead, actually, um, going forward. And I think also just working from that young age um, can do no harm, really. It's, you know, very sort of temporary, you know, Saturday jobs. I think earning your own money, having that responsibility to show up um, and to serve um really helpful actually yeah it's really good isn't it and I know I've had lots of conversations with my kids about getting jobs at that kind of age because my first job was I was 15 and three months because that was the criteria I worked at Woolworths but I did it as soon as I could but I think the thing now with retail particularly seems to be that they're wanting to take 18 year olds rather than younger kids and I, I know definitely we tried to get my son a drip a drop in the book bookshop and um they wanted 18 year olds it's such a shame it is a shame. I don't understand. I don't understand the logic no. behind it. I mean, both those age groups need jobs and need opportunities yeah, to exactly. develop their experience. Um, mm. 
Uh, so it's that seems very short-sighted. It does seem weird, isn't it? I wonder if it's to do with shift patterns and things in that people are kind of employed in a very different way now and maybe they've, they've got kind of got adults working during the week that also work at weekends. I don't know. Yeah, it's very probably, odd. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame. It's it a is shame. a shame. Okay. Um, so university. So what did you study at university and how did you decide which course you were going to go for? Yeah. So I originally wanted to do medicine. Um but um, <laughs> the physics failed me. I'm, I'm afraid I wasn't good enough at, at physics. Um, and I knew that from, um, from O-level, as they were called mm. then, onwards. So yeah. um, my, my sort of long ambition of, of being a doctor kind of went out the window when I was about 16. Um, what I discovered around about the same time was that I had a natural aptitude for languages and right. all things communication. So... Um, and I'd been very lucky. Um, I had, you know, I'd had, I'd had quite a lot of privilege uh, and had spent long summers um, in different parts of the world. Um, uh, I was multilingual uh, as a teenager, which was, you know, was a gift that was mm. given. Me. And I had a natural propensity for for language and for and and for for learning language and a real interest in the science of language and um, uh, so I kind of fell into doing a language degree. So I did um, uh, did French and Italian as my first degree. Uh, again, I've been very lucky. I went to the school I went to um, was very traditional, and we had to take Latin O level. Right had to take it early so we had to take it at 15. We also had to take our English language um, O-level at 15 as well um, and I think again the discipline and the rigour of of those two subjects stood me in good stead for any language I did afterwards and certainly with the Latin even now 50 years later mm. or 45 years later I still I still find myself drawing on that knowledge pretty much every day. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, yeah. how how did you get your start in your career, and did that involve languages? Your first kind of your first work out of university. Yes. So, when I was in my final year, um, I the original plan was to to do a postgraduate degree. Um, I wanted to do a master's in French mm. politics and culture, okay. um, and uh, I wasn't quite sure at that point whether I wanted to do that straight away or whether I wanted to work or or I wasn't quite sure but what happened in the February of my final year again I was just super super lucky my personal tutor um uh asked me um to apply for a teaching post at a university in France for the following year for the, the academic year that was starting after my finals and I jumped at that opportunity and that the gift of that was that it meant that from 7th of February I remember it so well from the 7th of February onwards right through my finals I knew what I was doing the following oh, year well, yeah. I, I was set up it was a fantastic opportunity it was extraordinarily well paid for what mm. it was. That was an enormous piece of luck that allowed me to just really focus on my um on getting my finals done and the plan then was was to go and do that for a year and then come back and do my um, do my master's um for which I would have needed what now seems like a very small amount of money I think compared you know uh, mm. was that two grand or something was the master's yeah. program um but it was the year that Thatcher cut the um funding for second degrees in art so I couldn't get any funding so right. I went another year in France and then um while I was doing that second year I uh spotted a another master's that I wanted to do which was um in film subtitling and dubbing so I did that instead I mean I knew that I wanted to continue to study and so when I saw this again which is going to make use of language and of understanding yeah language and how language resonates and translates I knew I had to do that master so I did that I never thought I'd ever use it and little mm. did I know that 35 years on I'd be using those skills pretty much every day um, but having mm. done a very circuitous path to, to get here and so yeah. I did that I moved then moved into commerce moved into a sales role um, I was again I spotted a job you know you have those moments in life where you spot jobs it's happened to mm. me handful of times where I've seen a job quite serendipitously and thought 
that's my job. That is yeah. my next job. And I saw this job. It was out completely in a different sector. It was working in um, in the retail sector, but they wanted somebody who could speak English, French, and Italian because yeah. they were looking for somebody who could buy ceramic and porcelain um, from Italy for the European market. I knew nothing about ceramic or porcelain or um, any of those things, <laughs> the, the language skills. So I applied for that job, got it, did that for about two years, absolutely loved it. I loved, you know, um, the creativity of building product ranges. I loved everything about um, moving, you know, negotiating those large sums of money. Um, I, I was in quite a junior role, I have to say, and a role in which there was no obvious career path for me out of that role. I could have stayed stuck in that role yeah. forever without any real prospect of moving forward. Um, and I, that became apparent about a year in. And what happened at the same time was um, uh, my father became ill and died. And I mm -hmm. was very inspired by the hospice movement and the hospice right. care that and we all received during his illness and uh, around the, the, the time of his death. This is 1994. And um, that's when I started thinking about moving to a different sector. I knew I didn't need to become a hospice nurse. I knew there had to be other opportunities mm -hmm. in, um, you know, social welfare or in a different kind of setting. I couldn't quite see what they were. Yeah. Um, I've sat on that for a while. I knew I wanted to continue learning. I knew I wanted to do my MBA. And it then suddenly became very clear that if I wanted to move into the not-for-profit sector, um, that meant returning to the UK. And I def the, the MBA programmes that I was interested in were in the UK. So I found yeah. I had this Damascene moment uh, where I realised that I was going to do something that was very counterintuitive. I mean, I was still very young. I was 28 30 at the time mm -hmm. um but i was going to do something that felt very counterintuitive which was stop and start again from scratch right um, okay. i did it i did it so yeah. it took me about a year to organize everything i yeah. returned to the uk started over um again serendipitously i saw a tiny tiny little advert in the guardian either one Christmas when I was back in the UK or in the Guardian Weekly that I would pick up occasionally in France. It's a teeny tiny little advert for a sort of two month course and charity placement. It's called Working for Charity, which was a charity itself, no longer exists. Um, and that was offering, you know, transition experience into for people like me or you know, mm -hmm. all sorts of people, people who have been made redundant, um, people uh, returning to work after natural career breaks, et cetera, et cetera. And so I knew that that was, that was the key that was going to unlock the door. That was the pathway. Yeah. So I, I came back, I did that course, did my placement, um, begged a second placement um, at a charity that I then went back and worked at two years later as their head of marketing um, and got my first job fairly quickly, very junior role, um, but was able in a brilliant, wonderful charity, which was then called Muscular Dystrophy Group, which is now called Muscular Dystrophy Campaign. Um, brilliant, medium sized charity um, that gave me so many opportunities to shine. Um, I inherited a wonderful, I was a trust fundraiser. I inherited a wonderful portfolio from my predecessor um, that set me up for enormous success um and yeah that was it was it was brilliant and I cap catapulted out of that role into very senior roles and I have muscular dystrophy group to to thank really for my for my career and you know, my 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 managers and my and my colleagues uh, back then in 97 98 when all of this happened and from then I um yeah I became sort of head of head of fundraising director of fundraising director of fundraising and communications did those roles for three or four years I guess and then moved into this niche of uh going into small um uh charities as their first chief executive so yeah uh, often going in on a turnaround transformation 
mandate, I guess. So yeah. going in to address sort of a multiplicity of uh, strategic issues. Um, you know, the organisation mm. may have been struggling for quite some time. There will have been sort of deeply entrenched issues that had not been addressed. So, so I did that. I did that for about fifteen years, and it was when I was in um, my last one of those that uh, that uh, the opportunity to with with some um, some colleagues at the Royal Society of Medicine came up to set up Global Health Film as a as a project, um, and which we did in two thousand and twelve, and then I left. Um, uh, my my full time CEO role in 2016 to move it from that project into um, uh, uh, into a registered charity and uh, yeah. and that's what I've been doing really since 2016. Yeah. It's really interesting to hear about your path through the charity sector. So I remember I did some work a few years ago now for um, cancer research with the learning team there about kind of career paths and. I think what they were saying at the time was they got so many graduates in that actually it was quite hard for them to progress up the organisation. So the kind of the more typical way in a charity is to broaden your experience. So you're not necessarily climbing up, but you're kind of building across. Um, and then obviously once you've done that, you can start moving up. No, that's I, I would say that's absolutely right. Um, and I think... The smaller, I mean, CIUK is, you know, is a, is a giant. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so the opportunities for progression within that charity will be much bigger than they are in most yeah. charities. Charities are much yeah. smaller. And, you know, usually to move up, you have to move out. Yes. Um, and that's a shame because yeah. that's a lot of, lots of, lots of skills, lots of, you, yeah. know, um, yeah. um, you know, it's an investment that, that doesn't get, that's, that gets lost, I think, in some yeah. ways, for organisations. But um, yeah, so you know, you find, I think, maybe it's the same in most sectors. But you know, yeah. at, at the sort of earlier career levels, people are tending to move or tending to have to move, maybe every eighteen to twenty-four months until they yeah. get into into those more senior roles, where yeah. there's, there's there, there's more uh, scope and capacity for 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 you know for for building your 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 yeah. own niche. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So you just touched on your C CEO role, um, so Royal Society of Tropical Medicine Hygiene. So I was going to ask how that came about and um, what did that organize? What does that organisation focus yeah. on? So that was um, that was another one of those small handful of you know you see the ad and you think yeah that that's my job. I had just yeah. finished. I'd done another of this sort of um, uh, this nervous tick about I've always got to do another masters kind of thing, and I'd just done a, mm. a masters in. Um, uh, international development, so it's very much dealing with the the issues that that RSTMH deals with, um, and I so I was I I'd done that masters to prepare myself for a more sort of global role, not in terms yeah. of empire, but in terms of outlook. So I was very interested in 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 global health and in inequity, and so I spotted this job and thought I I have that is my job. I have to get that job, and so I went in as its first chief executive. So the organisation at that point was celebrating its um, uh, centenary, um, I think. Um, it's a membership organisation that works in, uh, traditionally works in what we call in the UK tropical medicine, so lots of infectious diseases like malaria, HIV, TB, but also in all the areas of global health that I'm still now engaged in, <coughs> yeah. excuse me, but at a very different level. So um they provide um educational opportunities um conferences um uh scientific journals um yeah and a membership scheme for uh, tropical medicine and global health practitioners in the uh, uk and yeah. overseas yeah lovely yeah. organization yeah, that's good. So you've mentioned a few times now that you're kind of fortunate to find things, but I guess the thing is you probably knew where to look and you, did you have an idea of where you were heading? So you knew who to speak to and that kind of thing. Yes, I think... Um, I th So it's not that I was always looking for the next opportunity, yeah. but I think I always had an eye on how I could stretch myself yeah. next. And I loved every single job that I've had and I've remained you know uh friends and close contact with people mm -hmm. going 
all the way right the way back to muscular dystrophy um you know although sort of what's that now 30 years ago you know we still all meet up yeah so yeah you know yep. and i so but i i always knew there was i always knew i could achieve more and yeah. um yeah do more um and so i think the luck so there's that adage isn't there that yeah. you know, luck preparation meeting opportunity and you know that is there is some truth in that yeah. in that it is actually about the preparation yeah so preparation isn't necessarily about um being over obsessed on where the next opportunity is going to come from because you also have to you know live in the moment and deal with the, the issues in the moment but i think it's about reflecting on um how we can be better at what we do, how we can stretch ourselves more. And so I think when you do that sort of deep thinking, um, the opportunities come because you spot them, you see them because you've been thinking, you've been thinking yeah. about, them, you've crystallized some of that thinking, I think. So you see them and they they reveal themselves as opportunities where, where they might not have if you hadn't. Yeah. Been, been I mean I'm you know relatively ambitious I would say so yeah. I was seeing the opportunities that that sort of resonated with the ambition that I had I guess yeah. to um to work in a to you know to work in in an area that that really appealed to my own you know interests and values around social justice social exclusion inequity yeah. all those kinds of things and so I think that's where the luck comes you you and that's how you create it, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Um, so being kind of clear on that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That leads into my the question I always ask about values, and I think you've you've obviously you've already answered this, but um, so do your personal values have an impact on your work and who you work with? One hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. So I think, and I think that that was something that became clearer and clearer as yeah. as years went by. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think those things reveal themselves necessarily. Um, as fully defined thoughts, you know, yes. when, you know, when you're starting out, but I think they reveal themselves and, um, and that's what makes the job worth it, I think, yeah. you know, you know, and that what's, that's what makes the difficult parts of any job and especially any leadership role, you know, yeah. it's pretty, it can be tough, you know, it, yeah. you know, dealing with lots and lots of difficult things. But I think when, when you know that there's a greater good, when you know that even dealing with difficult people, if there is a commonality of purpose that you have to find and reveal, you know, then, and you can find that, you can create some common ground, even with very tricky people sometimes, yeah. um, uh, then it all makes sense. Yeah. But yes, and certainly I've had to make quite a difficult decisions along the way around you know for example turning down um partnerships um with organizations what you know potentially could have been quite lucrative partnerships but that just didn't align and yeah didn't resonate with the cause yeah. so yeah yeah and i guess that's the thing as you go through your career you get more confident in making those kind of decisions as well don't you so you can be true to your values because you've got more confidence in yourself definitely yes definitely yeah okay um so your your company website said you rashly left your job when you went on to set up global health film so you want to talk a little bit more about that yes and yeah. a bit more about what we do there yes no no absolutely so um so i left global health film in 2016 and again it was it would have seemed it did seem to many people on the outside like a very very counterintuitive move yeah. you know um lovely chief exec role um uh that i loved um and you know really enjoyed uh to yeah to strike out and do something that was very high risk in that um so global health film at that point had been just a um had it wasn't even a legal entity it was a project that had had some very generous funding um, in 2013 and that funding had just run out and the pipeline was very dry um, and I kind of knew that I had to do something if, if I was going to make it something I needed to um, 
something had to give. I wasn't going to be able to do justice to Global Health Film and retain a full a full time CEO role. Yeah. Um, I was also traveling between two countries um, pretty much every week. And it was it was just all, you know, something had to give. And yeah. counterintuitively, the thing that the, the thing that went was that was the stability, was the, the, yeah. the chief executive role, which and again, I didn't I didn't do it. I didn't do it lightly. But mm. um, yeah, and that that was that was rash. Um, but I you know, really believed in the potential of Global Health Film to contribute something um, unique and special to the world, um, something that could be very inspiring and something that people could could convene around. And so, yes, yeah, so I struck out um, and set it up as a charity. Um, uh, that was a slow, painful, expensive process. Um, mm. And... Uh, and here we are, sort of six years later, still very small. Um, yeah. um, and I don't know how much bigger we'll ever get in terms of our actual size. So our reach has grown. So we started out. So you know, ev everything in life to me feels like it divides into before and after COVID. And mm. we're a really good example of that, I think, in terms of how our services have changed um and how we've grown actually so before covid our main output was a london-based two three-day multimedia festival um yeah. which is based initially you know, at the barbican and um then in different uh, locations in bloomsbury um with covid we had to scrabble online pretty smartish like pretty much every other organization yeah. Um, and get with the tech very quickly, um, yeah. which uh, was um, it was a bit of a rocky road in the beginning, but we, mm. we know we got there. So we sort of went online um, initially as a short-term measure. Um, I thought at that time that you know we'd all be back, at every, we'd all be back, everything back to normal by by our December festival yeah. twenty. So this was just a sort of recruitment retention exercise, keep people engaged. So we, we ran a, a retrospective free online series of films from our archive um, every Sunday. And of course, very quickly by October, we knew that um, there, there was no going back to person uh, to in-person events very quickly. So we, yeah. what was really interesting, and again, th there is a degree of, of serendipity in this, is um, those online events that we did attracted huge audiences or huge audiences for us we would have you know up to 800 people at a single screening from yeah. you know an average of 25 countries around the world every Sunday evening it was just amazing to yes. bring all people together in real time and what came out of that was a steady trickle of request sort of requests for advice and guidance and know-how about you know this is, we love what you're doing we want to do this ourselves we want to do some yeah. screening this came especially from academics who, by this point, six months into COVID, were tearing their hair out over, you know, the delivery of degrees yeah. by PowerPoint um, remotely. And so we're looking to diversify the programme, but we're very quickly hitting lots and lots of barriers around, you know, how do we do it? How do we get a screening licence? What platform do we yeah. use? Our AV team, you know, are not, you know, not being helpful about this. And... An opportunity arose almost overnight for us to say, well, we can help with that. So mm -hmm. a very large part of our work uh, became overnight and remains today um, hosting and organising um, those kind of events for um, for universities, international conferences and other um, entities around the world and, 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 and through the year. Um, and so, you know, we so we've we've got a UK festival, and that will always remain. But yeah. uh, we also, we, you know, we program um, material um, in Europe, in Australia, in the US. Uh, we're opening in Zanzibar um, in in August. Um, so our reach has become very global, as it yeah. should, given the, given the, the, the subject yeah. matter that we deal with. And so that's been a really interesting and very gratifying um, journey for us to, to be getting more great film, more brilliant film to more audiences and more diverse mm. audiences around the world.
Yeah, as, as always, I've got so many questions, but <laughs> um, I suppose a question would be, so how how, do, how are your videos commissioned and, and who are the audiences who, apart from the universities that you've just mentioned? Yeah, so we... So we don't make film and we don't commission. So yeah. we're an exhibitor of film. So we right, tend okay. to be working with, so film te tends to get made in one of two ways. It's either commissioned yeah. Yeah. by a broadcast channel or Netflix or, right. or, okay, or, yeah. or wherever, or they're made by independent filmmakers, you know, very often as passion projects who raise right. money painfully over many, many years to get stories out. And our role, we come in at, at the stage where the film is, made yeah. usually not always sometimes we're involved um in some small way from the very beginning even from the concept stage but our role is to bring those films to an audience so films tend to come to us when they're about to films they get finished they go on a festival journey for yeah. about a year and then they either you know they get picked up by a sales agent or you know they they get you know um they go to onto a VOD platform or or, or whatever. Sometimes they, um, you know, the they end up on a on a shelf, unfortunately. And so our role is to select um, and showcase, uh, you know, the best work in yeah. that, that comes to us. And that work comes to us through a submissions process. So right, all festivals okay. have this, we have a submissions yeah. platform and people submit and then you select from that we probably select somewhere between four and five percent of the material that right. was sent and um uh yeah and so then the name of the game is to is to showcase that work at one of our festivals and i think the thing we do best at global health film is we actively seek opportunities once that festival's over to yeah. continue to find opportunities for those films and those filmmakers to get screenings around the world. So there are lots and lots of films that we work with that, yeah. are, you know, where we've we've maybe organized, you know, a, a dozen, sometimes up to 20 other screenings um, over the years in different different contexts. So that's how we support our, our, our filmmakers by finding opportunities for, yeah. for their work to be shown. That's amazing. And the, and the filmmakers, are they a range of people? So you might get some kind of really new independent people and then much bigger organisations. Yes, yes, uh, we do. And um, so lots of early career filmmakers. Yeah. Um, um, and in terms of the work, probably I think we probably attract about about half of 50 percent of the films that we get are short films and about 50 percent of feature length films, which is yeah. 90 minute kind of uh, yeah. length. Yes, lots, lots of, lots of early career filmmakers, lots yeah. and lots of passion projects, but then also lots of very, very established filmmakers as well. Yeah. Okay, that's From good. all around the world too. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, conscious of time as always. So, have you got any advice for people? So, this is just general advice, really. People that are leaving school or university and about to get started in their career. Yes. Um, and I've been thinking about. I've been thinking mm. about question because um i think things have changed so much since i went to university and i think it's a lot lot simpler i think it's i think it's more complex for 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 young people today but so my advice would be um you know so it's always easier to get a job when you've got a job so i would say start mm. getting a job start early if you can, um, and I'm really interested in what you said about, you know, um, what you're saying earlier about, you know, it being hard for people to sort of yeah. to get jobs. Yeah. Find opportunities to serve, mm. whether that's a paid role or in vol volunteering. Find yeah. opportunities that are going to um, help you develop your skills, uh, where you can make a good impression. Find opportunities to lead and leading doesn't have to be about being at the front or on the top leading can be about being reliable about being consistent about setting a really great example you know um that gets you noticed as much as yes. elbowing yourself to the front so i think yeah. i think that's really important find those opportunities ask for those opportunities and you know um so we also so one thing that we do is we have a lot of interns and there's a lot of polemic around you know whether interns internships should be paid or not mm. personally 
they should be paid. I don't think anybody should, should be working for free. Yeah. Some of the organisations that we work with really stipulate that they should not be paid. So I think, right. okay, well, I can find another way to reward this student who's doing mm -hmm. quite extraordinary work for us. So I think what I do is really work hard to create a projects for them that they can really talk up and speak to at their first interview you know yeah. and I think so and I, I would say to anybody starting out negotiate those experiences you you know um package whatever you can into a project that you can speak to with confidence and passion at yeah. an interview because it's everything is the next takes yeah. you to the next step yeah I that's say. really good advice and I think the negotiate one I think probably a lot of young people will worry about negotiating how do how do I do that but I guess it's about being prepared isn't it what what is it that you want out of this um, yeah. and it, it's a conversation so try not to stress too much about negotiating in a business sense but actually that's right it's 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 a conversation and the worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say no and if yeah. they say no they're the wrong fit for you so yeah, yeah um yeah I think definitely. yeah that's true that's true um and I guess one specific question related to your industry so any advice for anyone who wants to create a film around global health so what should they be thinking about I know it's a big question but <laughs> question so it's all about the story it's all about the human story I think what we're always interested is in stories that give the rest of us an opportunity to see the world through somebody else's eyes mm. to, experience, to, to experience the world walking in somebody else's shoes um the best films are about show don't tell they're not about yeah. telling anything they're about creating the space for us all to reflect and get our own learnings from so i would say um yeah where you start with your film or with your idea is probably not where you're going to end up mm. um but it's always about the human story brilliant really good advice so thank you very much so thank you very much jerry for joining me today and thank you for anyone that's watching and as i said please do ask any questions if you're watching on catch up um so yes yeah, thank you jerry it's been really interesting i've learned lots <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for the um, for, for the invitation. It's been lovely no to talk to you. At all. Um, I'm back next week on Tuesday um, at nine. So it's Tuesday the 9th at one. And I'll be talking to Varsha, who is a resume and LinkedIn profile writer for military and leadership. So that's going to be very interesting. She's based in India. So um, thanks again to everyone that's watching. And I will see you next week. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>